maybe the, the kind of real power of architecture as a profession is, is not actually in sort of retreating behind these certainties, but embracing the uncertain and being unapologetic about not knowing as a kind of knowledge. Business of Architecture UK, episode 62. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I was driving up to Northumberland to go and visit a group of Buddhist monastics on a project that I've been working on for many years. And en route, I stopped off at the anthropology department at Durham University, where I had the good fortune to sit down and have lunch with and then record a podcast with Dr. Thomas Yarrow, who's recently completed uh, and published a book called Architects, Portraits of a Practice, where he shares his reflections on architectural practice. A lot of this has stemmed from his shadowing of the Millahauer workshop, which um, was he had a very intimate relationship with one of the directors there, Thomas Miller. Um, and the book goes into a lot of wonderfully simple and hugely complex reflections about architects, the architectural profession, what it is that we do. And from this conversation for me, it, Tom really was able to celebrate the, I think the, the, the phrase was the everyday utopias that architects create, the kind of the grind, if you like, all the little things that get done that architects do that often we don't acknowledge ourselves for, but they are the things that shape the built environment. They're the little decisions that get made that accumulatively create architecture and the built environment. So Tom is a very... Um, accomplished academic himself. He did his undergraduate degree in archaeology and anthropology at Cambridge University before undertaking his PhD in social anthropology at Cambridge as well. Um, after completing his PhD, he held the Leverhulme Fellowship in Anth and Anthropology at the University of Manchester. He's also lectured in anthropology at the Centre of West African Studies at the University of Birmingham and at the School of Environment, Na Natural Resources and Geography at the University of Wales in Bangor. So sit back, relax and enjoy these reflections and the celebrations of architects with a conversation with Dr. Thomas Yarrow. Special announcement here. We at the Business of Architecture UK love to help you win more great clients and projects. And we've got a really cool opportunity for you. Our affiliate colleagues over at the Architects Marketing Institute would like to offer you a very special 45-minute one-on-one breakthrough call with one of their senior marketing experts. Now, the Architects Marketing Institute, which was co-founded by my good friends, Eric Bobro, Richard Petrie, and also Enoch Sears was one of the original founding members. So these guys really are some of the world's leading marketeers for architects. So you're going to be in very, very good hands. And on this call, the Architects Marketing Institute, or AMI, will help you map out a simple action plan. And this is going to be based on their experience of working with hundreds of architects around the world, where they've helped them increase their income and the quality of their projects. And it's going to be tailored to you, depending on your budget and your goals, and of course, your ability to be able to implement. So the Architects Marketing Institute, just like us at the Business of Architecture UK, absolutely adore and love helping architects and want to help you attract more and win better opportunities for your practice. So that is the one-on-one -on -one session with AMI Architects Marketing Institute. It's a free session, but in order to be able to qualify to have one of these sessions, there are a few required criteria. And the first one of those is that you are the owner, partner, or main decision maker for an architecture practice or design-related business you must be able to have the ability to provide exceptional service and results for your clients. And finally, you must be targeting at least a further £100,000 in additional revenue for your practice. So if that sounds like you and you want to speak to one of the Architects Marketing Institute senior advisors, jump on one of those breakthrough session phone calls, click on the link that's provided in the information and AMI will be very happy to speak with you and then after your successes, you can come and tell me all about it on the Business of Architecture UK. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm here today with Dr. Tom 
Yarrow, and uh, we're talking about your recent book called Architects Portrait of, of Practice. And you're actually not an architect, you're not from the architectural discipline, but you're an anthropologist. And you've completed this study looking at architects, the discipline of architecture, how architects are operating in kind of contemporary culture. And it's really, really fascinating to sit and speak with you and understand from your perspective what it is that you've like what what it was that's kind of had you write this book in the first place and the process that you've gone through and what and what kind of reflections you can share with us um, about how architects are practicing. So we'll, we'll start there with like, wh why? How did this begin? Yeah, there's uh, various ways of um, telling the story, I guess. I, um, I've always been interested, so I'm a, an anthropologist um, and I've always been interested in, in buildings and people's relationships to buildings. So through that, a lot of my research has been about uh, focusing on that sort of built space and the social production of built space and through that architects have always featured but often kind of on the periphery or in the surround so prior to this project I've been looking at architects role in the heritage and heritage conservation so this was really I've always been interested and I've had this in mind as a, as a project for a while that I've wanted to do um, but the other the other context really was that uh, one of the practice directors of the pra the main practice that it focuses on, which is Miller Howard Workshop, um, has, has really my oldest friend who I've known since the age of uh, about three. So it was also partly a, an exploration of and with that friendship as well. Right. So you, was, actually, you actually have a very close, intimate relationship uh, there and a first hand experience of watching somebody grow and become an architect I, I do so yeah I mean I think that's always something that's interested me is how um, in a way you know I've seen through, through him very intimately um, how one is shaped through architecture and how your life beyond architecture also shapes what you do architecturally I, mean, I think in some ways that's one of the interesting things about the profession mm. is how centrally implicated you you are as a as a self and actually how much you have to perform that uh, identity to be a credible architect so i mean in many professions what you do or say in your hours outside of your working life is really neither here nor there but both for for practice narratives and for personal narratives i mean i guess it's there in the part three training it's mm. it's about that very precise self-fashioning so that was actually one of the things I got interested in through this book but which I'd also kind of seen in a way uh, through your relationship up, up close and personal through my relationship with with Thomas and yeah. so tell me tell me a little bit about the process that you've got I mean how long did it take you to to curate and put this book together and what was the process that you went through of of of, of developing the ideas developing the reflections yeah, so the the book came out of um, and uh, and your intention with the book. Yeah, well. I, I mean, and, and initially it came out of, a, of another project actually, which was was focusing on something else, um, slightly different. I was looking at the tensions between uh, heritage and, and energy, which is an, another thing that I've been doing research on. So this was kind of just a, a context for that. Um, yeah, and so in terms of the process, I spent about uh, four months, I guess it was, over the course of a summer. Um, doing ethnography so um, an anthropologist once described that as being deep hanging out <laughs> um, architects in the practice came to sometimes refer to it as snooping yeah um, but basically just trying to get a sense of what was going on getting a bit involved in the process at times probably not very helpfully uh, at all so actually um, you were spending time in the practices so I was spending time in the practices in all the meetings uh, you know i somebody would be doing something I'd be saying what are you doing why are you doing it How, you know what do you think what's going on here and that'd be uh you know with, with more or less kind of t tolerating uh, those interventions so but I mean it's an interesting uh space to observe an architectural practice and and partly because actually a lot of it happens in in silence so how do mm. you kind of get inside the head of someone who's not talking so so f from your perspective being there as as an observer, what was what were the challenges doing that, and what were the sort of experiences that you were kind of, and what what, what were you trying to get at? What were you trying to? Well, I think most fundamentally, I just wanted to basically tell the story in in a kind of a big and broad and human sense of mm. what is it like to be an architect, and that was uh, a kind of for me as an outsider to architecture. 
um, that was that was the kind of initial thing and, and hook. And I suppose in writing this book, I've tried to explain that process in a way that I hope makes the familiar strange for architects. So I'm hoping to slightly disrupt that sense of, of what the kind of familiarity of the everydayness of, of what happens in an office is. Um, but also for non-architects to think of, to make the strange familiar. So all the kind of acronyms and the internal professional discourse that inevitably happens. Um, to try to make sense of that, as, as I say, as I mean, I hope it doesn't sort of sound pretentious, but as a kind of the broader human story, because in one sense it's about architecture, but in another sense it's about things that I think we all face as individuals. How do we live truthful lives in conditions that we don't choose in the face mm. of? How do we deal with contradiction? How do we resolve these ideals and ideologies that we might have? Um, in ways that you know are, are kind of meaningful, and 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 I suppose thinking about the relationship between a working life and and the life that we live beyond those, um, and and coming back to my relationship with Thomas, I mean that was what was partly um, so interesting about the process for me is that we had talked endlessly about our you know each interested in in the other's job and profession, but actually what that looks like in practice is a very different kind of thing and I suppose that's what ethnography tries to do is to, it tries to tell the story not of what people say about what they do but of what it actually kind of looks like in what, what were the things that you found surprising shocking and kind of that entertaining um I think one of the things I found surprising was how little of what happened was actually about design Mm. Um, I mean, the kind of external narrative of architecture design is very much the focus. But um, I, I guess this practice is not uh, untypical in that most of what happens is about paperwork, meetings, actually quite um, everyday kinds of things that happen in lots of uh, kinds of other kinds of office. And, and, and um, in one sense, I, I know that a, a number of the people within the practice found that as a kind of challenge. You know, you come out of architectural school, you're full of these ideas, these ideals, and then the reality is you're in meetings with uh, planners and it, 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 you come up against all these constraints and these pragmatics. And I suppose one of the things I've tried to show through the, through the book is how potentially those kind of constraints are also possibilities and challenges mm. and, and to see almost the poetry in that sort of pragma pragmatism to see that that not just as a sort of worse element of you know that you have to do in order to get the design done but actually which can be thought about creatively I, I, and productively i love this idea we're talking about it just now over yeah. lunch about this idea of the the revolution of the everyday yeah and the kind of reframing or the psychological reframing of the everyday tasks that so many of us do as an architect that's what the that's what the profession is because we're dealing with so much complexity in the real world of making buildings happen and often we can there is it's not uncommon for architects to experience that sort of disillusionment of the grand ideals that we had as at university of designing beautiful things and then the reality of it is it's really difficult to make even a very simple building yeah stand up and so yeah, so celebrating the, that that every day. How do you how do you go about framing that? So I mean, I think for, for me, it comes back with what I'm trying to do in the book is is actually not to sort of come in with any singular answers, but mm. actually to, to hold up this mirror and say this is what I see that's already happening. And in some ways, you're even already recognizing it, but in other ways, it's not as fully recognized or as central to your narratives of what architecture is as as maybe it could be. And I think uh, one of the things I, I would observe is that um, there's this sort of sense of the utopian that, that lies ahead potentially in a very distant future when professional structures have been changed, you know, in, in very profound ways. Um, but I, the way I would see it is that actually the, the kind of inside out um, version of the fact that everyday practice is hard, it's difficult, it's full of contradiction, it's full of different people telling you different things. Wherever you have contradiction, there's also choice. And so there's a kind of revolutionary potential, as I would see it, in, that, in those very everyday quotidian choices that all architects face. So it doesn't necessarily need to be the case that we have a completely fundamentally new kind of architecture or that capitalism has to be completely overturned before interesting buildings can be built. There are kind of 
uh, interesting subjacent possibilities within within that every day within those choices that people make and I think maybe if particularly people coming out of um, you know coming out of their training uh, I'm encouraged to see that more I don't know if that's a question of how uh, practice could be different or how training could be different or, or both but but to sort of um, not endlessly defer good architecture to some sort of utopian future but actually to see there are real possibilities well, it's, it's, it's quite a profound point actually that you're observing and making that's landing with me about you know we do as a university we do have this kind of very unusual unusually long gestation period for the development and education of an architect yes and it is in a very abstracted idealized world and that there is a responsibility that comes with you know if we're in that world for a long period of time and then suddenly we're kind of we pop out into the real world of planning and building regulations that we've got to be able to manage the the disjunct of it and the conversation actually rather than framing the everydayness as something that's mundane and um, we don't want to deal with it and it's just it's inhibiting our creativity what you're sort of saying is actually these are moments that can be celebrated that's, and that's right yeah and even even within you know very conventional forms of, of practice i mean i wouldn't want to characterize the the, the practice miller howard workshop as 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 normal it's not uh, typical but it's dealing with very typical uh, kinds of familiar kinds of frustration for most practicing architects to do with the way that the construction industry and the planning um, uh, system works and and so yes I think to see the, the possibilities within that every day and, and not to see those as, as sources of, 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 of just frustration but actually to sort of to grasp and dwell, almost dwell in those moments of, of irresolution because I also think that as an as an outsider that's what architects do very well um, is to kind of hold um, irresolution and not look too quickly for uh, ready-made uh, solutions or, or answers, but to have a faith that some answer will be there through through a, through a process. Um, so a kind of a, a kind of confidence in in a in a lack of knowing, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Um, you, you, were, you were saying this earlier that this is a really nice way of of putting it that there's. A kind of leadership, if you like, with architects in their confidence in not knowing yes. the answer and a, a faith in the the thought process or the architectural process of iteration and synthesizing ideas that's that perhaps a lot of people don't actually know that's what we do. And yeah, and I think you know beyond uh, certainly from an outside perspective, it's sort of buildings and ten, uh, buildings and design that people tend to think of uh, when they think of architects. But actually, maybe that's the the sort of the broader thing that you offer the world is is that we live in this world of huge complexity of specialism upon specialism where nobody can know everything so knowing a little about a lot and being able to choose thoughtful reconciliations to those things that ultimately don't resolve in the sense that there's no final uh, way you know there's no final solution there's no final way that they're going to come to together um, so I think more and more the world needs these these sorts of ways of, of thinking of people who can dwell thoughtfully in these interstitial spaces these unresolved spaces mm. um so the term spaces between i i, I kind of like so i think it gets at how that works not just in design but also in the more sort of ostensibly mundane administrative elements um there's a there's this thinker i like donald shun who's who, who writes about architecture but also other professions and he talks about the art of the specific case and how we don't give enough emphasis really to application as a, as a, a so how abstract clear abstract ideas are applied to particular cases and then mm. the kind of thoughtfulness of, of how that happens so it's not the kind of glamorous you know here's a new big thing but um the ability to do that well and carefully in ways that uh, satisfy the various people that you're dealing with. I think is 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 not something to be overlooked. What, what do you think the so how many how many practices were you interviewing? Um, in well, the, book? The, the the main the primary focus is on is on one um, practice, and um, so in a sense, it's an unapologetically parochial study. But I think uh, as an ethnography, what I would always like to claim is that we're interested in the relationship between small places and, and big issues so yeah. these these are sort of lenses so i mean i've I, i've 
as I said, it's an outside perspective, but I've read uh, quite widely comparatively around it, and I've talked to um, a number of architects uh, around the practice uh, in other practices. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I have some confidence that the kinds of things I'm talking about resonate, at least in the UK context. What do you think the impact of your observations has been on Miller Howard? Um, that's a really interesting question and um, one that probably would be better directed to them. <laughs> I mean, it'd be great to do if, if there's a chance to discuss this, uh, you know, as, a, as part of a freeway conversation, potentially. I think um, yeah, I would love the, to thing, do that. the thing they always said was that um, they recognised themselves in my descriptions, but they also saw what they did slightly differently through it. Mm. And I think the power of description, I hope, is a sort of opening up rather than a closing down. So I wouldn't want to come in and say, you should do this or you should be doing that better. I'm not a, an architect, I'm not a, a, an expert, but rather to make observations about how I see things working already. But actually that's an insight in the same way that looking in the mirror, we see ourselves slightly differently. So I think there were, there were various ways in which that potentially helped them to see things differently. And I think one which is already there in things that they were saying and doing, but is this kind of taking a bit more, um, a bit more pride maybe in in the sort of the poetry of the everyday and and, mm. the, and the bits that don't get celebrated in architecture, and I've actually seen those as also spaces for possibility rather than just the sort of stuff you do because you have to. Mm. This is what I'm finding really really fascinating. Actually, is this is this quite gentle but reflective and quite deep approach of observing what it is we do as practice as practitioners that architects perhaps we don't do enough of actually it's a very useful thing to be talking and the way that architecture and you know in practice operates and then we've got academia over here there isn't you know they the two seem to be kind of mm. pulling at each other in a very interesting way so being able to have an observational look at architectural practice and what, what, what we're doing and being able to sort of document the, the everydayness of it and actually celebrating that. I think that's a very, very useful tool for architects to be engaging with and, and looking at because of the opportunities that it can afford in terms of, you know, actually just in, just if nothing else, just in terms of acknowledgement of, of the of the breadth and the skills of what it is we're doing and contributing to the built environment. Yeah, and I think you're right that in a sense, even if it's actually doing, I mean, I, I would hope that that some of it is is recognizing even more how there there is potential uh, in in architecture as as already practiced for the vast majority of architects in in fairly kind of everyday kinds of ways. But I, I do also think that that's an important thing that. A lot of the disillusionment, I think, that I detect, particularly in people that are just right out of university, is because this very idealised version of the profession comes into contact with this very different version of the reality. And actually, rather than thinking maybe of like the utopian as this sort of future distant thing, I think if people can see how it's actually close at hand in the choices you make every day... Mm you know, to answer this thing on that thing, to choose this or that. There's always these, uh, an overwhelming number of decisions. Mm. But those decisions are, are actually what perpetuate, transform, remake architecture yeah. daily. And I think if people can see those as also uh, moments to draw sort of pleasure and reward from, that that's also a, a, a non-trivial thing in a way because it, it means the whole generation you know there's a whole generation of architects that well you think okay well I can't do it as, a, as I'd like to do it perfectly so I won't do it at all it's it's really nice actually because it's even got me thinking about you know a project I did recently and the one of the sort of major sticking points was getting a dropped curb outside of the of the surgery yeah. to getting cars in and actually the process the months that we went through in planning fighting and sent just the endless form thing to get that done that's actually that is like a little moment of utopian ease where people can come in and out of that of that scenario that can just be overlooked yeah and not appreciated and like we forget that these little moments in the built environment they do they take something to to happen and to be able to facilitate that is is very very important it's a it's a great role yeah 
I think there's also something about the sort of t- the teleology of the design process that it, it's always geared towards the future. So you're always kind of mm. thinking, right, and it's not just in architecture, it's, it's in, in the Western world in general, but, you know, we're always thinking, okay, our lives will be great wh- when this thing happens and suddenly everything drops into place. But actually it, it is, um, I mean, I guess this is a kind of a cliche, but it's the process and it's having that, t- taking your validation from that, from that process and, and not kind of wanting there to be this final moment where everything drops into place and, you know, individually speaking or professionally speaking and suddenly everything is, is, is resolved because it's, I think it's those tensions, it's those points of resistance where, where we find ourselves challenged and, um, and, and, and remade and, and, and remade in good ways, not just in sort of becoming worn down or stressed, <laughs> but, but that maybe that's the, 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 the tension is like how we, how we inhabit those kinds of irresolutions in a way that doesn't make us go crazy, mm. but but actually we, we embrace them. So how, so how has your study of architects and architecture, how has that informed your own practice of anthropology and, that, of, and of people? Yeah, that, that's a really, a really good question. Um, and I mean, I, I, I guess I would start by saying that I think like architecture itself i think anthropology is a discipline that likes to constantly see the challenges of the world not just as things to be overcome but also as sort of profound challenges to ourselves so in that sense it's a sort of it has an uneasy relationship with the idea of professionalism as i think architecture does also we we we're, we're kind of doing stuff according to a methodology and in a particular mm. disciplinary domain but we're also wanting to try to be slightly different and new people and, and, and challenged by that um, and I guess I mean what I'm holding up as conclusions to the extent I've got them are also partly what I've taken myself which is that my working life has many of these same sorts of characteristics of um, being stretched very thinly having to make choices and I don't think I always personally uh, have have recognized how that's also important you know working for me in a, in a, in a university system mm. many of the frustrations that academics have about that system and the you know government policy and etc cetera, etc cetera, the marketization of it so i think sometimes there's that similar a similar form of disillusionment actually mm. and and i suppose I think my work with architects has, has encouraged me also to, to to try and you know take some of those findings back into my own working life and and uh, yeah not to be overwhelmed by the sort of <laughs> fact that the world just keeps on going and is full of endless problems. <laughs> you you were saying earlier about this the kind of the the position that the architect occupies in the built environment and that many parts of this disillusionment might be as a result of. You know, one on the one hand, the kind of ideals that we have about what practicing great architecture should be, should be, mm-hmm. and the romance that we have from mm-hmm. the architectural heroes of the past, and then the reality of running daily practice not being anything like we envisioned, but also the increased amount of specialized disciplines that are emerging that seem to be taking away the role of the architect. But you you were talking about this the kind of the power that the architect still has of being you know at the apex of being able to look down and understanding a little bit more yeah. about that. Can you speak a little bit more about that and your observations? Yeah, so I suppose I, w- I would say that um, I think that the, 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 there's a sort of paradox that the, the, the source of architectural power is also a, a form of vulnerability mm. as well, um, in the sense that you you know a little bit about a lot, which is so you have oversight of a process which you you choreograph and that that means that you you have this position of, of of oversight and therefore power but also means that the discipline structurally speaking has has always been vulnerable to encroachment from other forms of 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 discipline and other forms of interest so um i think there was a kind of period in the heyday of modernism when architects were fairly powerful but since then, there's, I think there's been these these forms of encroachment, which have, have, have so, and then and then I think what architects often do is to retreat back into the safety of narratives of either design integrity, so design is a form of specialism that these other disciplines don't have, uh, which 
I think narrows actually what architecture is about, or, or equally yeah. into sort of professional narratives of um, you know sort of part three stuff. And again, I don't think that actually is a very authentic version of what architecture really is as practice. So that's, I think that's why I'm sort of encouraging this nudge towards I know something that many architects already acknowledge, which is that um, yeah, that maybe the the kind of real power of architecture as a profession is is not actually in sort of retreating behind these certainties but embracing the uncertain and being unapologetic about not knowing as a kind of knowledge mm. you know which i think architecture of, of of all the professions i can think of anyway is is really the one that kind of does that best dwelling in those uncertainties. i love it i love it i love yeah. that do, do you think that there is inside of that inside of this kind of power of embracing not knowing and being confident to navigate through you know the unknown is there potential for that skill set to be taken out into other disciplines i i i mean i i I certainly think so um and i think um yeah, maybe that's the shame of it is that the is is where the professional space of architecture also becomes, you know, because there's this sort of vulnerability, this encroachment, that there's a defensiveness that then means that architects think well, architecture isn't about business or it isn't about being a developer or it isn't about being when actually, you know, the way to grow potentially is to sort of embrace all of that and say, be confident, say what we have here is an approach, mm. and that could be about. Yes, it's sometimes architects design stuff, but basically it's about a sort of creative approach to unknowns, and that, that, that there's something that um, in a world of complexity, of massive specialization, of hugely complex problems, these are these are all problems that architects can have things to say about. I'll, I'll see it that way. That no, that's, that's really really fascinating. How how do you see from your you know your in, your observations in architectural practice? What do you think are the are some of like the the commercial obstacles that architects are facing from your from your perspective? What what were like what what were some of the specific things that were causing f- conflict or friction? Um, I mean, I think the very question of what. Of, of what of whether architecture is commercial is, mm. is in a way is one of the sort of interesting tensions isn't it because i think there's a sort of it's like it's a dirty word you don't you, you go through your whole architectural training and business isn't really ever mentioned is it yeah and so then that's i think a tension is like a lot of architects they don't see themselves as as, as business people but yet they they inevitably have to be and, and are so I think there's um, I think that's a really interesting kind of for me it's interesting but I think it's potentially a problem for, for, for a discipline which which both is a business and pretends not to be mm. um, is it, is it, I don't know it, if I've quite answered your question no there. no yeah. it, 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 it's interesting because it kind of it kind of just points back again to this this sort of the the st- struggle of identity if you like yeah like there's, there's there are bits of being an architect which perhaps we don't always want to embrace and certainly the commercial aspects can be i mean some architects love that aspect of it other architects are like why are we having to deal with this yeah part of the industry why are we having to deal with this and and th- there is something and again it depends on the education it depends on the individual but there is perhaps a culture where we become a little bit averse to the commercial realities of of, yeah of, of what creates the built environment yeah and i guess i mean you know maybe part of this part of the story is of, of making architecture more unashamedly commercial and not being afraid of those spaces and challenges and the challenges of of, of, of business and of commerce but then mm. you know the more the more and more architects get into that as, a, as an actually an interesting challenge rather than a problem then the more you're also making business architectural Yes. Um, thinking about business in a in a specifically creative uh, and and truthful, you know, thinking about it creatively in a way that's truthful to to what the profession is about, rather than these sort of canned. Otherwise, I don't think it's just architecture that if you don't think about business, then other people think about business for you, and and you kind of drop these models in in which you know don't, often don't ring very true. Yeah. So. 
Exactly. And, not, and often the people that are thinking the most about the business are the ones that end up calling the shots. Yeah. Or they end up directing the processes in, in a way where it's kind of like, oh, hold on a minute, we wanted to go over here. But that's right. Now that's we're right, doing yeah. this. Very yeah. interesting. Brilliant. Thank you so much, um, Tom. I really enjoyed speaking with you and look forward to going deeper into the book. And um, if people want to get a copy of the book, what's the best thing for them to do? Um, probably just online on Amazon or um, it's available at the Reba shop, I think. Um, Brilliant. I'd I'll like to say all good bookshops, but I don't <laughs> think. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Excellent. I shall, I shall put a link uh, to the book in uh, the information of this podcast. So. Thank you so much for your time, Southampton. Thanks, I really enjoyed talking about this. Yeah. Brilliant. And that's a wrap. Thank you very much for listening. And of course, don't forget to book your one-to-one breakthrough session with the Architects Marketing Institute. This could be one of the most important conversations that you have around your business this year. So follow the link in the information and grab that opportunity. And I look forward to hearing all about it. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.